everyone. A very, very warm welcome to our Target Jobs webinar, What Jobs Can You Do With a Humanities Degree? I'm Jackie Barrett. I work at Target Jobs, and um, I'm, in fact, the proud holder of two humanities degrees. Um, I'm going to, I've got a lovely panel of three with me here today, and uh, we'll introduce them in a second. If you've got any questions for, for me or, or any of the panel, please just put them in the, the questions chat, and we'll try and get through them. Um, I'll be asking questions, which will sort of kick off the, ge the general conversation, but we can just start by introducing the panel, and I'll just go in the order I have you on my screen. So if you can just say who you are um, and your job role, and a little bit about the organization you work for. So we'll start with Laura. Hi, yes, thank you for having us. So, and I work at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Um, my role currently is talent attraction for the north of England. Um, and obviously, Enterprise Rent-A-Car is transport. It's a, a company that, that provides transport sort of globally. Um, but we're so much more than that. We basically bring our employees in and we train them to be managers. We train them to run a business. Um, and we have a real wealth of diversity within our workforce from loads of different backgrounds and also loads of different disciplines, hence the reason I'm here today. Great, thank you. Atif? Hi there, um, my name is Atif Jalil and I work on behalf of the Department for Education. I'm not sure that requires that much of an introduction, but but I am only talking about the, the teaching aspect rather than working for the DfE itself. Great, thank you. Catherine? Hi, apologies for my tidiness. My uh, laptop decided to do an update just before this <laughs> session happened, as is always the way. Uh, I'm Catherine. I'm the Early Careers Recruitment Specialist for Azets. Um, those of you who have not heard of us, we are the ninth largest accountancy firm in the UK, um, and we recruit kind of around circa 200 graduates each year. Um, we don't have any specifications on what background people come from, and we've had some great success with humanities students in the past, um, so hence my attendance today. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Hebe. Hi, yes, so my name's Hebe Williams. Um, I work at Savills, um, which is kind of like a global real estate firm. Um, and I look after the graduate recruitment for the UK. Um, we take on about 100 to 140 graduates um, per year. Great, thank you all. So, and we are aware, sadly, that the press can, there is some bad press around humanities degrees and that it's harder to get a job, et cetera. And, I know um, my daughter started university this year and she's doing a science degree. And I know that when I tell people that, their reaction is, oh, great, she'll, she'll be employed, she'll be absolutely fine, you know? And I think, yeah, but what if she was doing English Lit? I'm sure she would be employed as well. So let's just kick off with how important do you think degree subject is for getting a graduate job? You can jump in. Um, if it gets chaotic, I'll, I'll call you out by name. <laughs> I'm happy to start on that one. Um, so I've recruited for a number of different sort of early careers programs within different industries. Um, when I first started out, I thought it was really important and I typically recruited for like marketing roles um, and always found that the managers always wanted someone with a marketing degree, kind of that pre-existing background. Um, but from the professional services and the kind of, I guess, accountancy industry perspective, um, degree subject does not matter at all anymore um, and actually never has. My dad has worked for KPMG for 40 plus years and he studied history at uni. Um, right. So it actually just goes to show that the, the misconception has gone on for so long um, but actually you know it's not necessarily um, been given any any real thought in the industry um, this year alone we've hired people from uh, language degrees history geography um, I had someone from optometry the other day from a music college so just goes to show that you know the the industry that you're studying in doesn't necessarily reflect and we also say that people who come from an accounting and finance or an economics degree don't really have any advantage over others apart from the odd exemption for some exams um so yeah for me it it really doesn't matter but i definitely agree with you jackie that that misconception is, is still very rife in the industry great in fact we'll probably go on to talk about that sometimes humanities um subjects degree studiers actually have some advantages over the other ones anyone yeah, else yeah. I was just going to move that yeah I think I, I completely agree you know that the degree discipline is not important it's the attitude that you have it's the skills that you're able to demonstrate from your um, extracurricular activity your work experience plus obviously your your academic course as well and actually you know humanities is our fifth most popular degree within our workforce currently um, so you know that, that that just shows that really demonstrates that those key skills you've just mentioned Jackie in terms of the communication skills the creative thinking the strategic thinking that are 
that are gained from a humanities degree are, are just as important, if not more so, than a lot of academic study. If I could just jump in there. Um, yeah. I agree with everything that everyone's saying. And I think, I think I completely agree with that as well. Um, and for our... <laughs> I think we've lost Hebe. No, Go ahead, Hebe. Should I jump in? Yes, jump in. Okay. <laughs> it was that awkward silence I thought I'd better say something. Um, I, I certainly agree. In, in terms of teaching, it's the way that a degree works, uh, I think for most people, is that it teaches you a set of skills as well as subject knowledge. And it, and this is what Laura was saying, um, and certainly what Mary and Catherine, is that the degree is teaching you a set of skills, which is what is most important, rather than the actual subject knowledge itself. Um, and this happens, and I've got examples outside of teaching, but I'll stick to the DFB remit here. When we when we talk about teaching, the humanities degrees, I haven't got statistics like Laura has in terms of how many there are, but if you look at the subjects that are taught in a school, then you've got the English, maths, and sciences, and, and as are the core subjects, and it depends where you want to put English, but then everything else sits under the other umbrella. And so anyone who's got a humanities degree certainly works well there. But when we talk about the, the importance of a degree itself, I can tell you right now that I'm, I'm speaking to people, there are two people that I know who are medics. One is a lecturing uh, medic. Uh, the other person just finished their, their medicine. I've got RAF pilots who are sitting there speaking to us, getting into teaching. We've got accountants. I mean, it's the list continues and it's beyond what you normally would would think that these people are very happy so there's an element of happiness that goes into all of this stuff as well and i think that is something that we need to um, at least focus on when you're going for a career that don't let the degree be the bit that's holding you back but also look at what you want to do with it um and the kind of career that you want to go into that's going to make you happy and also perhaps don't choose your degree subject because you think it will make you employable if it if the subject itself is not going to make you happy studying it yeah, totally. And this is the same case when it comes down to the medics that I've spoken to. And this poor girl, if I give you an example, she's in, she's come down from Scotland. She was studying in, in St. Andrews, I think. And um, she did like six years of medicine. And it's only after the six years that she said, it's not for me. I don't want to do it at all. And it's a very difficult de degree to get into. The access is quite difficult. But she's decided and she's come to a realization that it's about what seems to make her happy. So focusing on the skills that it gives you, uh, I mean, universities are, you know, a great moment um, in, in one's life. It teaches you far beyond what happens in the lecture theatres. So I'd say if you're going to go into it, take advantage of it. If you're there already, then you certainly know what I'm talking about and, and gather as much skills as you possibly can. I think um, my, my friends on the panel have mentioned this already, that get into the extracurricular stuff, get into all the other societies and build that set of skills because it's it's that what's going to come out. Certainly in teaching, it's the, the level of communication, the, the art, the, the ability to articulate yourself, that's going to be the bit. You could have lots of knowledge, but if you can't end up giving it to anyone, and that goes across all, all different types of jobs, if you can't end up transferring that skills to over other people, impart that knowledge, you're a little bit stuck. Yeah. So Laura and Catherine, are there, are there any jobs in your organisations that someone with a humanities degree wouldn't be able to do? I'm happy to jump in. Um, we don't really have swim lanes as such. So we only bring people into our company on our management trainee program, regardless of their discipline that they studied. Um, so, so absolutely not, you know, anything is possible. And from that point on, we then promote from within. So, you know, people move onwards and upwards through the management ladder. They maybe specialize a little bit further down the line into things such as finance, training, um, marketing, things like that. Um, you know, I, I personally had a fashion degree when I joined Enterprise and I genuinely thought that they would put me in a corner and laugh at me because I had no business knowledge. But what I what I did have was ambition, drive, passion and, and all of these things that Atif mentioned. So that the communication skills, the, you know, the the um, the critical thinking, the creative thinking. And actually, I was embraced. I was welcomed in. I was trained. I was developed and I was promoted you know, numerous times through the management ladder. And, you know, I think it's not just about somebody who's studying humanities being aware that there are possibilities out there. I think it's also about them having the confidence that they are going to be welcomed into that workforce and that they have got a place in that workforce too. Yeah, Catherine? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have lots of different streams, uh, lots of different pathways, tax, audit, accountancy, corporate finance, etc. And uh, not a single one of them requires a specific degree background. Um, so we're, we're really, really open. And we actually we really embrace that diversity. Um, you know, for us, the things that you've studied will, will cause you to perhaps think in a different way or know how to research in a different way. Um, and it's great, actually, when we don't have a team that have just studied economics or accountancy and finance, because you're bringing in that diversity of thought, which allows for you know greater performance across the entire team. We've had a question from Alia saying, how do I respond to people with a negative attitude towards my English Lit degree? Um, I'm sorry to hear that you, you have experienced that. I don't get the sense that anyone on the panel would react like that. My gut feeling maybe that it's a conception that sort of English Lit, you just sit around and read books. But actually, I think if you can sell the skills, teamwork, creativity, communication, analytical skills, you know, all the skills that you get with an English Lit degree, you'd probably be okay. So it's more about convincing the employer. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would, I would echo uh, what you've just said there, Jackie. Um, I think, you know, it's about thinking about what in your degree is a, is a key skill for the area that you want to go into. So obviously from, from my perspective in a finance side of things, analytical skills are really important. Research skills, really important, particularly within the tax industry. Um, so it's about sort of pulling out in your mind, okay, I'm good at X, Y, and Z, what industries require those sorts of skills? Um, I'm interested and intrigued to hear that, that people have had that sort of negative attitude towards English Lit students. Um, I mean, I remember when I was at university, you, you, you know, always asked everyone what they studied and things like that. And you would always ask at that age, what are you going to do with that? Um, I think people hadn't necessarily conducted the research into careers at that stage to think, what am I going to do with this? Um, but, you know, being in graduate recruitment now and, and being someone who's been recruiting in this field for a couple of years, um, I've definitely you know, never seen anyone turn their nose up an English Lit degree. Um, if anything, it means you have very good written communication skills as well, uh, which is something that is, I think, prized in, in pretty much any, any role that you're going to go for. Absolutely. Anyone else like to add to that? Go on, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> It's a race for the button, isn't it? Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to very quickly add that um, when you're talking about the, the, the degree subject, um, an employer wants to hear the passion that you, you talk about it with as well. You know, they want to understand that you've really um, adapted and you've, you've, you've sort of focused on something for a period of time that you all, you know, you've, you've given your all to it. And that kind of passion, that kind of um, commitment is something that the employer can then see you you know, also putting into employment with them. So you can very much flip it on its head and, and, and turn what could be a negative conversation into a, a positive one by demonstrating those skills that Catherine mentioned, but also then the passion too. Ali, I would also say show people the recording of this webinar. Because <laughs> uh, she, she's mentioned that it's her family and acquaintances who have a negative reaction. And that is probably just from the misconception of thinking, oh no, you're going to find it really difficult to get a job. Um, if, I, if I could jump in there, I, mm -hmm. there are, I think there are, there are certain cultural elements attached to, to the negative perspectives on, on particular degrees. Mm -hmm. I think that if you think that that's something that you feel yourself, you let people tell you this and you start believing it yourself, that could, it could, that, that could be this case for every other degree as well. Um, I did engineering and, and in a family full of, I think, medics and, and pharmacists, I think people they might have looked at me and thought, "What on earth have you done? You've completely gone off top." And it's it's what it is. It's what you think that that brings, and you, only you will know really well the skills, uh, the understanding that is brought, and the way that 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 will end up helping you out and others. I mean, in teaching, we never look down at at, at a core subject. It's I mean, it's impossible. Um, mm. If it wasn't a subject that was worth teaching to children, that every single person in this country seems to have been taught, then you know, we wouldn't put it in the curriculum, it's in the curriculum, and as are others. So if, there, it's in the, if it's been taught in school, it's very important. Clearly the government and every other government in the world feels that this is something that's important. So I think that that's, that goes without saying anyhow. Um, but in terms of, and I'll, I'll reiterate the same point, if you think that that's something that is true of your own degree, then you're gonna let them win that fight. I've got a friend, and this is going completely different, this is more towards, I suppose, Laura and Catherine's kind of group and, and, and probably heavies, but I've got a friend who did English Lit at, um, at UCL, he did well, and then he's gone into the finance sector. You know, mm -hmm. it's different because it came back to what all of my all of my, my friends are saying on the panel, that it is about the skills that it teaches you. And that's all that they were looking at. They thought that when you come to the career, we'll teach you everything else, that's not a problem, but at least show us an insight into your ability to take up some skills. 
Absolutely. Hebe, did you want Hi, to add? Sorry, I think I just got off. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I think um, for us in terms of our graduate roles, they are actually you do need um, an accredited degree in order to undertake them. But um, we're seeing so many more students joining now with um, any type of degree. So obviously humanities degrees included. And then they'll do sort of a master's, um, and which is sponsored by the business. Um, so it's free of cost to the student. Um, and actually, yeah, I think students who come from a slightly different background might actually end up after the two year programme having completed their master's with a way broader experience and different and new ideas, which are really great for the business. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely a benefit um, to go into a different type of industry because you come in with fresh ideas. So let's talk about skills now. We, we've touched on it. So what do you think are the, the main skills that humanities students arrive with that are impressive and that they should make sure they demonstrate? Perhaps as opposed to, I mean, I don't want to generalise, but perhaps that they particularly excel in having done humanities degrees. probably communication skills, which mm -hmm. is definitely key to a single job. Um, written communication, um, also sort of presenting, really good at research um, and analysis as well. So I think across the board, those skills are definitely really key and would be sort of nurtured during the degree. Okay, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll add on there, so definitely echo everything that Hibis just said. Um, and then also I would probably say that the kind of team working element, so you, if you have those group projects within your degree subjects, learning to work together as a team. Um, and then the final one I would say is operating in the grey. Um, I like to think that humanities students, there, there is not often a right or wrong answer with, with a lot of the stuff that you're doing. It's often very open to interpretation. Um, so from our perspective, being able to operate in the grey, you know, make some decisions based on the information available to you and not necessarily knowing if something is you know definitely right or definitely wrong but being confident enough in yourself to, to proceed and, and make a call based on that information um, is a skill that maybe someone who was working in a you know I guess perhaps more a scientific degree where there is a right or wrong answer or in maths where there is a right or wrong answer mm -hmm. may not be as comfortable operating within that sort of remit. Yeah that's a really good answer actually so it's sort of like not panicking just because the answer isn't immediately obvious being able to actually see it as a challenge, like, oh, okay, I'm going to work this out. Yeah, if I can add on that, I completely agree with that. And I think you know, from a business perspective, if you think of any boardroom in any any business, you know, globally, we do not want the same perspective 100 times. We want to have people that think of things in a different, you know, slightly more creative way. And so having that ability to, you know, look at things slightly differently and, and bring it maybe a different solution to the table would be very much, you know, um, something we would back within within business. Can I jump in there, Laura? Um, I was going to say that we mentioned things like communication and we mentioned things about working together, which is all great. But I think it goes beyond that in several ways in that in the humanities is where you end up celebrating diversity. It's where you actually en encapsulate the history uh, that, that other people felt have gone through, the languages, the culture, it's all encapsulated in the humanities, more so than it is in the sciences. There's definitely mm -hmm. idea, but it seems to be done more there. And in a world where internationalism seems to be going on, people are, you know, the, the, the borders are almost seem to be decreasing, now they seem to be breaking down, just in some regards. That kind of knowledge, that kind of ability to be able to go past what, what is your norm and what is your comfort zone, I think is really important. Certainly in teaching when you've got a very, I mean, in London, you've got a very diverse background. Um, I'd say that it does, the sciences do teach you, you know, how to work in the grey somewhat. I'm from an engineering background and I taught maths, so. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to diss the sciences. <laughs> but I can tell you that that in itself doesn't seem to teach you as much as, it, as the humanities-based masters that I ended up doing taught me mm -hmm. that's the truth of the matter you know and if anyone else seems to have done something slightly different uh, or, or a similar degree but has a slightly different experiences do let me know I might have gone to the wrong place but that seems to be the case so I would say like look at the focus on the diversity aspect and the bit that allows you to go cross culture in in this element you know if anyone starts speaking about well what is it what has it brought for you I think the understanding of being able to understand the other mm -hmm. Definitely, because and hopefully in your jobs, whichever job you have, you're going to meet people from all sorts of different backgrounds. 
um, and it's important to get on with people, both for yourself and for the success of your job. Now, what about uh, this question? Maybe best to Catherine first. So you're an accountancy firm. So what if, let's say, I'm looking at, at your specs, and you know, I need numerical skills, or maybe um, sort of to be comfortable with technology, etc. That might scare me a bit if I feel, as a humanities uh, student, I don't have that. I'm, again, I'm not trying to generalize. I'm sure plenty of humanities students do. But how would you suggest um, I approach that if I was applying to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. I guess the first thing to say is that we, we do assess a basic mathematical capability within our process because you are dealing with numbers. Um, but I'd also like to say that this is at a GCSE level C um, is the kind of highest level of maths you're really going to require. Um, with the enhanced digitalization of the environment that, that we live and operate in nowadays, you don't do a lot of maths in finance. Um, and people always kind of say this, like, oh, I need to be good at maths. I'm like, you need to be OK at maths. And you need to be probably better at using technology um, mm -hmm. and comfortable with systems. So we pretty much in accountancy, a, a spreadsheet or you know a system that we use will do the, the numerical side of things for you. Um, you know, if anything, it's more just your attention to detail to make sure you're entering the data properly so that it can then be calculated correctly. Um, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't say that we we put an, an overarching emphasis on maths. You know, we don't ask people to have a maths A level or anything like that. Um, it's literally just that that basic knowledge, that basic ability to be comfortable with numbers to some extent on a day to day basis, um, and then that comfort of of using technology to to perform the task for you. Great, thank you. Any anyone else on the panel? Do you have any competencies or requirements that you think might make a humanities student pause? And how would they go about demonstrating that they have them? Ours is the same as what Catherine just seems to have said in terms of you need okay. to pay some GCSEs in English and maths. Um, and then you need to have subject knowledge. I mean, the fact of the matter is that if you're teaching, you've got to have the subject knowledge. You're going to impart knowledge onto others. If you don't have the knowledge to begin with, that's going to cause some problems. But there might be there might be degrees that you might be doing at the moment in time that aren't clear cut related to a national curriculum subject. So if you're doing psychology, for instance, you might feel that that's something that isn't taught in many schools, what do I go about? I mean, you can certainly do it, it's not a problem. But if you've got an A-level in the subject with a grade B and above, then mm. you can possibly, you, you can gain access to something that's known as a subject knowledge enhancement course that enhances the knowledge. It gives the universities that kind of reassurance that you know what you're going to be talking about. Or if you did a degree a while back and you want to think come back again, it's more like a refresher. So that's pretty much it. But in terms of what you need to be able to get into teaching, you need your GCSEs in English and Maths, Science if you want to do in primary, and then a degree. And that's what it says, a degree. A degree. A degree. It's not, you know, the, the fact of the matter is if I did, I did, like I said, I did engineering and I want, if I want to go and teach French, the obvious question will be, <laughs> we know you know enough French. And so yeah. I'll prove that. And if I'm a native speaker, then I don't need a degree for it. You know, mm -hmm. I've got a degree in something completely different, but I have the skills. So it's about showing that you have the knowledge that you're going to impart rather than the degree. Most, most cases, you, um, providers, universities will look at your degree because that's generally the best way of looking at whether you have the subject knowledge, but it isn't, you know, that's not the definitive way of doing it. Great. And Laura? Yeah, we, we, we focus on soft skills. We focus on those other lovely things that we've been talking about, communication, leadership, teamwork, flexibility, work ethic. You know, we, we look for somebody with a fantastic can-do attitude who's solutions focused and, and, and positive. Um, so, we, you know, it, it really shouldn't put anybody off, hopefully. <laughs> Great. I've got a question from Bethany saying, how can I make my CV stand out from other humanities graduates? So competing with other people with humanities degrees, what do you look for? What will really impress you on a CV? I'd go back to the things we've been talking about, about the, the skills that you can dissect from your experience. You know, think about those those things that we've just sort of mentioned. Catherine mentioned quite a few of them, the communication, the the ability to operate in the grey, the, the teamwork, the leadership, 
those pull those things out and, and really relate it to the role you're applying to. Do not do a one size fits all CV or application. Make sure that you understand what's needed from the company and from the role and, and use those experiences and, and, and tie them together to tell a story of why you're your good fit. And then also look outside of the degree, look at the extracurricular, look at the maybe employment or volunteering or um, SU involvement that you've had. And again, pluck out all of those skills that relate to the specific role, the specific company and tell that story. We've lost Hebe. Um, I'll, I'll go next here, that's all mm -hmm. right. Um, so first and foremost, when I'm screening CVs, we don't look at CVs um, anymore. That's kind of something that I used to do at, uh, when I was at PwC previously, um, and we've now kind of, I've introduced that over at ASETS as well. Um, so CVs don't form a part of the process until the final interview. Um, mm -hmm. At the final interview, obviously, because the manager hasn't, you know, seen you do all the different tests and the things that we've sent you, we do put the CV in front of them at the moment. That is subject to change. Um, I'm personally of the opinion that, you know, just blind interviewing is so much better because you will genuinely find out more about the person rather than expecting or having any kind of preconceived ideas of them. Um, but if you are in a position where you, you know, you have a CV, uh, absolutely echoing what Laura said there in terms of, you know, pulling out those extra curriculars, thinking about what else you've done. Um, and then even going as far as to, with the CV, look at the values of the company that you're applying for and see what sort of, you know, background or experience or activities you've taken part in that could demonstrate those values. Um, so to give you an example, you know, one of our values is collaborative. Um, you may never have, you know, had a job where you've had to work in a team or had to do anything where you think you've got a particular example. Think outside of the box. Have you ever done any charity events? You know, did you do Duke of Edinburgh when you were younger? There's all sorts of things that you can pull in here and they don't have to be directly relatable to the job. I think is the expectation a lot of people have is that if I can't demonstrate exact work experience, they won't consider me. Um, but it's all about those transferable skills and demonstrating the values and the behaviours that we're seeking. Um, and you can do those through a multitude of ways. We don't have CVs either. Um, I think everyone's familiar with the UCAS application form. It's, it is what it is, it's the application form itself. But there is an aspect in there um, that requires you to write about yourself, so the personal statement. And it's like um, Laura and Catherine have said, don't focus on the actual elements of what the job necessarily might require you to do, because you might not know that, and let, you know, go to, go to the actual ideas behind it. Um, what I would say, sending for personal statements, they read a little bit different to job applications, uh, as you can imagine. But we're talking about the skills that you've got, how you develop them, and how you're going to serve and bring what you're going to bring to the table, as opposed to. And I read, read many times somebody would write down something like, "I'd like to become a great teacher because I'm going to uh, because I'd like to work with children." And I've heard this in interviews, and I end up saying, "Why don't be a clown?" I mean, they, they work with children. And they're like, oh, you know, that's not what I meant. And you're like, I know what you meant, but you haven't put it in that way, and it can be misread. You've got to be really clear about how you're going to put the idea across and focus on the skills that you've developed. So you mentioned the things that you've done, the extracurricular stuff. Sorry, I did some camping. But don't assume that the reader now knows what you got from that particular aspect. So if you've done some charity work that Catherine's mentioned, that's great. But you may have got something completely different than somebody else who might have done some. So make it a little bit more apparent. Be specific in that and say these are the skills that I seem to have developed and this is how they're going to then help me in this business. So then, like Laura said, you cannot then have a one size fit all. You can't run this off and apply to several different jobs. It's going to have to be specific. And, and Tiff, with the, what you've just said, it ties in with a question we've had about um, any cliches that we should avoid um, as humanity students when we're applying for jobs and what you just say about saying, I want to work in teaching because I love kids, you know, yes. I think we all know that we should avoid something like that. Any other phrases anyone comes across a lot and just thinks, no. So my rule is don't say something that you can't prove. Um, mm -hmm. So don't say I'm a dynamic individual with you know excellent timekeeping and you know, buzzwords, basically. If you're going to use a buzzword, back it up. Give an example, um, you know. English students should be fantastic at this. I remember from my GCSE days, I think it's P, you have to point evidence explanation. So if you're gonna make a point, back it up. Um, don't just list a long reel of words that you think will make us happy, um, because anyone can do that. Anyone can type a word out on a piece of paper, uh, but give an example of when you've done that. So 
you know, if you're going back to that collaborative example I gave earlier, so um, as collaborative, I worked in a team of four to arrange a charity event for the local um, homeless shelter um, to run a food drive. Um, we got X number of donations, which is more than they've ever had before. Something as simple as that, but it's going to make your CV so much more interesting than just you reeling off a bunch of um, words to us that don't really mean anything. Yeah, we, we don't take CVs either, actually. It's a, an online application for us. So we don't really have those kind of buzzword sections, if that makes sense. Um, we pick up the phone, to be honest, as soon as we get a submission and, and, and speak to the human on the other side of that mm -hmm. application and try and get to know them. And, and uh, you know, absolutely, we, we ask people to evidence. Um, and, you know, coming from a student perspective, when you're walking into an interview where you are going to have to evidence your skills, you have to do self-reflection. You should have done it during the application anyway, but you have to do a real... A real amount of self-reflection and understand those experiences, dissect those skills and, and be able to articulate them. Um, we advise people to use methods such as a smart method to make sure that they get right through to the result and, and therefore can really truly emphasize what they've done, their impact, and therefore obviously evidence those those set skills. But yeah, we don't we don't have any kind of cringe moments as such, but be aware that if you do come out with a cliche, we might just dig a little bit further and ask you to, to really demonstrate those skills instead of just wearing the t-shirt. And equally, I assume at an interview when talking with someone, if they start quoting your website, that will not go down very well, right? Like you, you might say, oh, well, what do you mean by that? And make sure they really understand what they're saying, right? Rather than just saying the words they think that you want to hear. Absolutely. And then they glaze over. So they'll say something yeah. that's absolutely killer and then they glaze and they don't listen to your response. So when you go back with those follow up questions, there's nothing there. So, yeah, I think that's it. That's another great point. Don't don't flash out information. that's very obvious. And, and, and if you're going to and if you, you know, something slips out accidentally, listen, engage with the answer that you get back from the employer and, and be able to actually you know, have a conversation around that point. Because if you've been interested enough to cite it in the first instance, you should be interested enough to hold a conversation about it too. Absolutely. In, at, at our end, employers want to know that you have the understanding and not just the theoretical background. So if you're going to mention anything when it comes down to proving that you've got a set of skills or you've got a, um, an understanding of something or another, mentioning it, just merely mentioning it isn't going to give credit. It's how you're going to apply it within the actual, in, within the personal statement itself. So yeah, make sure avoiding the buzzwords. I think everyone knows what those buzzwords generally tend to be. They, they some, sometimes tend to be specific to the actual job uh, and the sector itself, mm -hmm. but if they are, try to avoid them. And if you're not going to, because sometimes they can't be avoided, it is the best way of actually putting yourself forward. And then that's, that's what you want to do. Make sure that you back it up with um, an understanding that the reader will then be able to take from the fact that you actually understand what it is that you're talking about and you're not just mentioning it because men, you know we in our example in personal statements we tend to say that if you went into school and you got some experience tell us how you understood what teaching is all about and then somebody might say well i saw a teacher and i think it's very important that they time keep and then they are good role models and that they can plan really well and that's great you've told me what you think it seems to require the job itself but you haven't told me anything about whether you've got this acquisition and, and whether that means anything to you other than just reading off a list of words. So giving some examples that are real unique, I think is going to be setting you apart. Great. Um, we've also it's a broader question about timelines and, and when you should apply for a graduate job um, and if uh, COVID has changed when you should apply, you know, should you be waiting until after you graduated or before? Anyone want to jump in? I'm happy to. I think we're a bit different to most graduate recruiters because we actually recruit all year round. So, you know, we will take somebody who graduated 15, 20 years ago um, and we'll bring them in in January, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're you're in your final year or you're going into your final year, my advice would be to apply the second those applications open. A lot of companies will um, basically close off as soon as they get to their needed talent pool. Personally, we'll bring in around 1,500 graduates in this next 12 month period. So we, we have a large talent pool to pull in. Um, but what we do say is that if you apply day one and for whatever reason you're not successful, take our feedback, use it, gain those further skills and apply again six months later because you never know what might happen. And if you haven't applied on day one, you're not giving yourself that six month leeway. 
So yours is a, a six months in between applications, yeah? Some companies have a year, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, six months. Yeah, yeah. great. Catherine? Um, yeah, so I guess from our perspective, uh, it's a 12, 12 month rule for us, just to just to clarify on that side of things. Um, we do typically launch most of our roles um, in the kind of the classic milk round of September, October. Um, and if you're after something that you maybe think is going to be quite competitive, um, you know, corporate finance in London, as an example, is always a, a pretty hot job or anything in London, pretty much uh, from from our side of things is, is very popular. So apply early. Um, most of our roles, we work on what we call a rolling recruitment basis, kind of what Laura just described there. Um, you know, as we fill the roles, we will take them down, they'll be removed from the website. Um, some of them will have deadlines attached. So obviously, again, be mindful of those. And I think majority of kind of professional services and, and kind of accountancy employers will, will do the same with the opening in September and kind of going until they're full there. Um, but the kind of the, I guess the caveat to that is occasionally we do have some sort of ad hoc roles that pop up. So they weren't necessarily forecast for us to be recruited for within the next year. Um, but it might be that someone's had a promotion in an office, which has left a bit of a gap. Um, someone might have had to relocate for whatever personal reason. Um, so we do add roles throughout the year as well. So it's worth kind of keeping keeping a look at, keeping a track of. Um, but yeah, essentially um, that's sort of the, the general, we, we did the pretty classic timeframe. Um, and I think the other question, the other part of that question from Rachel was about um, how long you can apply for grad roles afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. So I said, uh, we don't have a time limit. Um, you could career change 20, 30, 40 years after you've got your degree if you wanted to. Um, I guess the only thing I always say to people is that um, after a certain point, if you've been working in one industry and, and getting quite a good salary, um, you do have to expect that you will probably encounter a bit of a salary drop if you're going to retrain as something else. Um, but that's the only real limitation that you know we see in that aspect is that can you afford to to, to drop and to retrain. Yeah. And ATIF, I, I guess Department of Education is a fairly strict uh, schedule for application, yeah? Somewhat, yeah. I think it carries on with that traditional element in that we start applications open in October the year before you want to start the course. So that's when they open. Now, I would say, if you've read the news recently about the education teaching in particular, you know that there's been an unprecedented surge in Africa. Mm. It's one of the few jobs that were carrying on all the way through the COVID period. Um, it's also given an opportunity, I mean, the lockdown's given an opportunity for people to reevaluate whether the current job that they're in at the moment is something that they want to carry on. And if it isn't, then they've always wanted to give back to society. You mentioned cliches, there's one. Um, and so, so definitely avoid that. But if they do want to, then I'd say get some experience beforehand. This is something that I was gonna actually ask the rest of the panel as well. When it comes to teaching, we always want to know that somebody has had some level of experience in there. So they know what they're going to be getting themselves into. They didn't just wake up one morning and think, oh yeah, I watched Waterloo Road or uh, you did something and now I know everything. It's a good show. <laughs> it's a good show. Or Grain Deal if you wanna go that far back. And now I think I am so prepared, this is what I'm going to do. And they come in and the reality is very different. So we'd like them to get some ex some exposure. Some universities ask for a little bit longer. They, they'll say that a minimum of 10 days. Uh, others are saying any time will be quite good. But is that the same for all the other panel as well then? So it's Catherine and Laura have got the same kind of situation in terms of you've got to have some experience beforehand. No, no experience required with us. Obviously, it's beneficial because some people will join the team to become an auditor and then be like, wow, this was not at all what I thought I'd be doing or, or be unsure. Um, we ask students or candidates to demonstrate an understanding of the role during a video interview um, to allow us to kind of make sure they've done an element of research. Uh, but no, um, we, we don't require any work experience or kind of prior knowledge. Yeah, same here. No, we we absolutely don't require that um, that previous experience. And I think because we do bring people in in such a broad role, a business training role, you know, we we, we train it on it. We, we teach it all. So there really isn't that necessity there. Um, so, yeah, no, it's it's just sort of those basic skills that I mentioned before that people need to have and, and be able to kind of demonstrate to come in. But we do believe in um, people understanding what the role is. So I think that's a slightly different side of the coin, potentially. And we, we counter that by making sure in our recruitment process, we actually bring our candidates into our location. So it is just, you know, a one day kind of visit, but they get to speak to people doing the job. They get to see the training format. They get to speak to the, the management team and, and, and sort of get a bit of a 
a try before you buy experience, if you like, um, because I think it is quite a, a misunderstood position um, at Enterprise Rent a Car. Obviously, it comes with a, a tagline of rent a car, and people think it's just that, and it's so much more. So, we try and get that across to our candidates so they have their eyes wide open and know fully what it is that they're committing to when they join. And um, Laura, I think I think you have to answer this next question because not many people would connect uh, enterprise rent a car and doing a fashion degree. So we've had the question: What do you say when you're asked, you know, um, why this industry or this firm? You know, how do you how do you justify your motivations if it's not obvious because you've not done a vocational degree? I think that, that can be like a really daunting situation to be put in. And, you know, we, we talked about um, earlier being able to demonstrate the skills that come from your degree. And if you have truly understood the role of the industry that you're looking to go into, you should definitely be able to do that and show that um, the fact that they are so transferable. So that's one way to kind of counter that. And then I also think, you know, it, the further knowledge of the understanding of the industry or the role or the progression or, you know, whatever it is that, that is in front of you in this potential opportunity can definitely um, highlight the, the commitment that you can make and the, the energy that you could bring to that role. You know, for me personally, like you say, coming from a degree in fashion, I, 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 I had nothing in terms of, you know, that, that kind of business knowledge, but it was the fact that I was so passionate, I was so driven, I, I wanted to be successful, but I didn't want to do it at the detriment of my own personal morals or at somebody else's success. I wanted to be mm -hmm. successful alongside my teammates and my, you know, my fellow colleagues. And that was a value that enterprise holds dear, you know, that teamwork aspect, that 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 sort of collective um, mission, if you like, and, and without me knowing, and I hadn't done that research, so I was incredibly lucky that 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 resonated but that was something that you know really demonstrated that I I aligned really well with that company that role and and the industry so it worked for me <laughs> uh, Catherine or Atif, do you want to, to answer that question no there's not wild enthusiasm there for that one that's fine <laughs> How about the, this is a big one from Edward, will postgraduate qualifications give me an edge over other candidates? No. <laughs> not, not at all? Not, like. not in our industry, no. Um, obviously there, there are specific, you know, if you have a financial qualification, so if you've gone on to do the ACA or the SEMA or the CTA, whatever it might be, all the abbreviations, um, then yes, absolutely. Um, but I, I've definitely, in the kind of different industries I've worked in, seen a trend that in the UK, masters and, and kind of, you know, further MBAs and things like that aren't necessarily held as so important. Um, but when I used to work for Philips, I did some recruitment in the Netherlands. And mm -hmm. over there, my gosh, having that further qualification puts you so much further ahead than other people. Um, I think okay. I had someone who had two masters um, over a candidate that had one masters and some work experience. And they chose the person with two masters uh, because in the Netherlands, they they hold you know qualifications and education in an exceptionally high regard. And they think, well, if you've done that, then that's better than having work experience. So if you're someone who is keen on working abroad in the future, um, then it's definitely worth kind of having a bit of a look into that and seeing seeing again what that is but from my experience across the UK um, unless it's a very niche role when I was at PwC we had a uh, kind of an environmental and sustainability consulting role you had to have a very specific masters for that one but apart mm -hmm. from that we, we didn't ever really you know need to know if there was anything further beyond the undergraduate degree okay uh, sorry is there a girl or can I go forward Yep, go for it. Um, so when it comes down to qualifications, very similar to what Catherine seems to have said, I think that is the trend in, in, in the UK at the moment in time. It's all about whether you're able to perform the job rather than whether you look as if you can perform the job. So the masters will help because it would suggest the fact that you've got a greater understanding and the same goes for a PhD and you know add a number to all of the others. But at the end of the day, if you have all those um, qualifications and are still unable to impart that knowledge, then it pretty much means nothing. And following on from the same kind of um, stem of question, does it matter where you go in terms of the degree itself or the, so the previous degree, the undergraduate degree, or where you do your PGCE, the qualification to become a teacher? Uh, no, it's almost like, I mean, the example I give, it's, it's very much like uh, in medicine. When you go into an A&E room, you don't tend to say, whoa, 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 hold up. I want to know where did you where did you do your degree again? Was it Norfolk? And if it was, and if it wasn't, you know, UCL, I'm not too sure about it. Um, 
it's not a problem because you know that there's been a equality assurance check mm -hmm. at a very high level. It's the same thing with teacher training as well. So you don't need to worry about that. You may wish to go into more research-based universities later on and, and add to that knowledge because you want to tie up the theoretical knowledge with the practical knowledge that you're getting in classrooms. But does it matter? No, not at all. Laura? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Doesn't I matter. think we are probably going to see a trend of people moving to do, do more masters than, than we've seen previously. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely hearing the, the, the people that I'm speaking to out at universities. And all I would say is if you've made that decision 100% that you're going to do your masters, A, be aware that it might not open those doors on its own. Use that time that you're doing your further study to get involved in so much more stuff. Get involved in societies, get involved in um volunteering maybe charity activities like we've mentioned and because it's all it's the whole package that you're going to have by the end of that maybe year in, in in study that is going to help you advance it's not just that piece of paper i'm afraid i was going to say if anyone's uh, listening on this and they're, they're in the middle of a master's don't be disheartened it's, think of it as a way to make yourself even more well-rounded it's just on paper it's not going to be essential for these jobs and do all of you look for, for two ones at least two two and above two two and above okay yeah. yeah we just look for a pass grade okay Catherine we are currently a two one um mm -hmm. however I'm working on that so uh, <laughs> watch this space I've got a few people to persuade in the business um right but yeah there's a potential we will be moving down to a two two um depending on some conversations that are hopefully are happening this summer Okay. And so when we talk about just the whole application process for graduate roles, are there any, um, not just with humanities degrees, but are there any misconceptions about it? Are there any things that you think really seem to surprise your applicants or aspects that they find the most challenging that you could give a few tips to anyone listening about? Um, I would probably say the most challenging aspect a lot of people will find very daunting is the video interview. Um, mm -hmm. We do a pre-recorded video interview, so you can record it as many times as you want to. You have the questions beforehand, so you've got plenty of time to practice and, um, you know, get get ready for the questions. Um, but I think certainly when I speak to people there, they just find it so uncomfortable, the idea of recording themselves and then having to watch themselves back afterwards as well to make sure that it sounds and looks okay. You know, they're not mm. fidgeting during it or doing anything weird. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely a, an aspect that people find really daunting. Um, and I would just say with that, like, unfortunately it's one of those things you have to push through the discomfort. Um, there, yeah. there is no real solution to it. And, you know, in this increasingly virtual world, especially with, with COVID and with the pandemic that we've, we've and having to rely upon these tools more and more often um people have i've heard all sorts of weird and crazy tips from people um from sticking a picture of their mum next to their webcam so that they Aww. feel like they're talking to their mum instead of you know the scary computer um from people who have you know gotten their um friends and family to watch it back instead of having to watch it back themselves and having that pain and just getting that more kind of direct feedback from them so there, there's all sorts of kind of means out there but i would just say that you know annoyingly it is one of those ones that practice makes perfect on um and the more of them you do the less uncomfortable they will become um mm -hmm. so yeah just just really pushing pushing through the discomfort there and in a way, I think COVID must have made it a bit easier because we're all more used to seeing ourselves on screen and sort of scrutinizing how we look and worrying about, does my chin look double, etc. It's always people's voices. They go, do I really right. sound like that? That's the, that's the thing. People I know, always I say, always think, I'm so nasal. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, a tip? Sorry, it's lagging, so I wasn't sure if people were talking. Oh. I didn't want to talk for anyone. <laughs> Um, yeah, with um, with our process, we um, actually got rid of our assessment centre not that long ago. So we've tried to make ours a bit easier than it than it ever has been. And although we have had to utilise technology to do sort of virtual interviews, again, we've tried to keep that human factor. Like I mentioned, we want to get to know our candidates. We, we pick up the phone and talk through the application. We then have a an interactive video interview. Um, so it's not quite as easy to practice, I suppose, as, as Catherine was saying. But you can still log on to a Zoom call on your own and record it and watch it back. So those, those opportunities is to kind of get rid of those maybe annoying idiosyncrasies. It, it, that, that opportunity is still there. It is cringeworthy. I hate watching myself back, but yeah, it does help. Um, heading to the internet and typing in frequently asked questions, that helps. It mm -hmm. seems really basic, but that genuinely 
really does help. And that will help you then decide where to focus your attention when you're thinking about your own self-analysis and your reflection on your own experiences. Um, so, yeah, just real basic things. But spending you know a day doing all of these will genuinely help. Our, our, our application process, I think, is well known to everyone who's gone through a degree process. So it's, again, go back to you, Cass. Um, that, that aspect, I think, is the least daunting aspect of it all, mm -hmm. um, of the application form. It's when you get to the interview process that it starts looking very much like what Catherine and Laura are speaking about. So we don't have a recorded element, fair enough. But I wouldn't say that that's something that you shouldn't get used to at all, because if, you know, if, if your industry has got it already, Catherine, Hours has it somewhat in terms of teaching people once they're in the job and they've been there for a couple of years or so, you know, one of the things that they would ask, one of the head teachers would ask or any senior teacher is, why don't you record yourself? Because I think you need to realize how you come across and you don't know, not until you've seen it. So that seems to then become a very daunting aspect. Going back to the application process, you've got uh, a presentation. Most times universities would invite you in and they'd ask you to present. And if you don't come across as somebody who's confident in your own skin, that is very easily highlighted. I mean, for those who are watching, it's it's quite obvious. So some of the things that people ask you to do is at least present an idea that you seem to have learned at university or elsewhere that's linked to the subject that you want to teach. Uh, you've got about five minutes and try to break it down. So the idea here is that you break down a very complex idea, potentially very complex idea into layman terms because children may not understand it in the very, very beginning. They may not have the background for it. and and in certainly for it comes to primary, then you're presenting the information. You've got to be engaging. So you've got a crowd in front of you, you've got an audience. How are you going to captivate them? And the reason I mentioned, and if, if I can just hold the mic for a little bit longer, the reason I mentioned, or I rather asked uh, the question about whether you need prior experience was because I think that there might be a misconception held that once you've gone down one of these industries, then that's it. You've made a decision at 21 and that is it. You've got to stick to it. That isn't, um, certainly not at ours. We've got lots of, as I mentioned the examples before, there are lots of people who are changing careers much later on, so it's not a problem. And I would say that education in the same way isn't one where you think, oh, I've gone down this road and I cannot get out of it and this is it, I'm gonna see myself retire in a classroom. You're not. There's lots of different factors, when it, well, there's lots of different factions when it comes down to education. You don't necessarily have to be in a classroom. Uh, I myself have gone into lecturing, I've done consultancy abroad. So there are lots of different areas. There's charity work. Most charities tend to have a person who's part of the education department. So look at it from the holistic point of view. And I think that's the same for all the other sectors. And also um, know that if you have gone down this route, so certainly for education, see it as a graduate scheme. You know, in some cases, they would pay you some money, there will be some bursaries attached to it. But there are skills that you will learn from every single one of these, um, these sectors that will be applicable elsewhere. And they'll probably make you a very good candidate when you go around second time into something else. So you don't necessarily have to feel that this is it. This is it and forever. Absolutely, thank you. That's nice and reassuring. Can I just echo what, um, what Atif said there as well? I'm personally someone who, I went to university and I studied clinical psychology. I was convinced I was gonna become a clinical psychologist. That was all I wanted to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Left uni with my degree, got my 2-1, all good. Went and started working in a mental health hospital, which I did for a year and a half. And then after a year and a half of working there, I realized this is not what I want to do with my life. Um, and that's absolutely fine. And kind of at 23, I was like, oh, no, I've, I'm, I'm two years behind everyone else. Like, what, what do I do now? Um, and, you know, I'm 30 now and I manage a team of people, you know, head up the early careers for a company of you know reasonable size. So, you know, don't feel like you have to have everything decided and sorted out right now. And don't feel like the pathway that you go down now is going to be your be all and end all. It's OK to go. It's not right. And it's not for me. And as long as you have open conversations with any, any of your employers in the future about it, then that's absolutely fine. You know, it's, it's OK to, to not even make a mistake, but to just change your mind. Exactly. And I, I assume and hope that you wouldn't think that that year and a half was wasted time because you probably picked up lots of great life lessons during that, didn't I you? I am skills. the most resilient individual, I think, from working in a medium secure mental health hospital. <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I was, well, not really, if I'm honest, although what I was going to say was that there is a there is a pathway, obviously, with an enterprise where you can specialise down the line. So we find this. We find that people learn about themselves in our business. And that's one of the mm -hmm. things that many people come to us for, because you do get, get 
infrastructure to finance to marketing to logistics to HR you know there's so much that goes into the, the role itself and and you know people do learn and grow and develop into a certain pathway within our business I certainly have I didn't think for a second I would be in recruitment or talent attraction when I joined sort of 15 years ago but after the management levels it, it suddenly became attractive to me and I think you know entering any company as a graduate we're aware as graduate recruiters that your life is going to change that your needs mm -hmm. are going to change you know I personally have had two years out of the business I've worked part-time when I've had children I've gone up to full time and then dropped again for other reasons and you know you're a human being first and an employee second and we get that we understand that and we want you to learn and grow and evolve as a as a human and as, as an employee and we will definitely support you in that too absolutely um, we're well, coming to the end here just uh, two similar questions from Laura and Ella about sort of how, where do they start where do they find out about sectors well I'd say your first your first protocol has to be target jobs of course and then maybe some of our competitors um, no, of course not. Um, but you'll find on our website just so much information about different sectors, what to do with different degree subjects, although I think as we've established, you can go to so many different things with different degree subjects. Um, you can find out about employers. We have employer hubs. We have videos. We have all these the webinars on our website. So I would say that would be a great place to start. And then if you, if you look at some, uh, an employer and you read their description, et cetera, you think, oh, that sounds good. You can then go to their website and find out even more. Um, I guess I just really want to end by saying thank you so much to the panel for, for all your information and tips. Do you have any final words of, of reassurance for, for our listeners, our viewers? Um, I would just say to those who are struggling to decide what they want to do, it's okay to not know. Um, you've probably got friends all around you who've got grad schemes lined up and they know exactly where they want to be and what they want to do. It's okay if you need to take another year to think about it. Um, obviously, at the end, at this time of year, there's not so many events out there that are being run by companies. But you know, come October, that's when everyone starts kicking off again and doing loads of events. Take the summer, do your research. Kind of as Jackie said, you know, look at the target jobs websites. Maybe speak to the careers advisors at your universities. See what they can offer. Get a few ideas of what you might want to find out more about, and then take the opportunity to do that it's not a race um everyone needs to go at their own pace and it's better that you feel more comfortable with the decision that you're making of the career that you're going to potentially undertake rather than just applying for anything under the sun because you feel like you have to excellent advice thank you laura atif um yeah i i would echo that but i would also say you know Sorry, can you hear me okay? Breaking up slightly, but yeah. yeah. Okay, um, but I would, also, I would also say, don't feel like you have to wait if you want to, to give it a go. You know, there are jobs open out there. I think there's a misconception that there is nowhere for a graduate to go right now. There are opportunities out there, so take a look at them. Um, yes, don't apply to a million places. Don't just send out a, a, a CV to, to anyone you can think of because it needs to be the right fit. So do your research and make sure it is the right move. Um, but that you know, don't don't close that door. Don't think that you have to wait until sort of the milk round, as it was sort of September October time. Um, and the other piece of advice I would quickly give is is connect with people, link with people. You know, we're all here, kind of giving our advice, giving our time. And I'm I'm sure I'm, I'm not you know in the minority when I say you know we'd happily sort of accept LinkedIn connections and all of that kind of stuff and, and give you advice on a one to one basis as well. It doesn't have to be for our specific role, for our specific industry. You know, take the help that's out there for you. Absolutely. We're in this business because we want to advise and help people with their careers. Um, on the same point, I would say if you're not decided, apply for teaching. And, then, and it sounds really strange, but I genuinely mean that because you don't know what it is. I don't think many people grew up thinking, I'm going to end up replicating Mr. Smith, you know, who's my geography teacher or Mrs. Smith, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And I didn't think that either. When I was at university, there was a scheme that was being run. They allowed you two weeks, or was it four weeks, in school, and they were going to pay you for it. And I thought, ka -ching, yeah, I'll definitely sign up. And I was doing it, it was going to be completely different. I wasn't going to go down this route. And when I found myself in the classroom, I thought, this is really, really good. It's something that I really like. And coupled with the fact that you're not you know, selling your soul when it comes down to a particular sector, you've got a lot of movement. The other sectors would happily accept you because you'll have built some more skills. So. I, my advice, honestly speaking, and this is without my DFE hat on sometimes, I would say apply, throw your hat in the ring because you apply in October as, as that's when it all opens up. And if you're still deciding, go through the process of the interviews, bag the actual um, acceptance offer, 
And then if you don't want to end up taking it up come the next September, not a problem. But if you did go ahead with it, you would end up gaining some skills that would be universal and very transferable. So if you're in doubt, this is not a bad shout at all. If you definitely know what it is, then yeah, give us a shout. Absolutely. And also I'd say finally, as well as going to, to any of us or our websites, etc., don't forget about your friends and your family as well and asking them if they know someone in other sectors. You know, it doesn't even have to be an official thing. Have a chat with people about what they do. People can you know, it can surprise you sometimes. Think, wow, oh, I didn't think that was that interesting. Or, oh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't even have that on my radar that that was actually a job. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to be kicked off any minute now. I'm not quite sure how this works. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. It's been really interesting. And, and I hope that we've, we've helped anyone who's been on the call. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. And thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you.